Coming up on this week's show, the best modern Sonic game gets a retro port. Achievements come to the GameCube. And we chat Theme Hospital to Two Point with Mark Webley and Gary Carr. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every Friday with our incredible mates at Bitmap Books. Now, have you seen the incredible N64 a visual compendium packed with over 150 titles that defined the classic Nintendo 64 system. They're all in there. Super Mario 64, GoldenEye 007, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Banjo-Kazooie, and of course it's got that beautiful artwork that Bitmap Books are famous for. So if you love that, check it out and the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay. Now, if you're working on something over the summer, you know they offer a fully featured custom PCB prototyping service, low cost, fast turnaround quality boards. And if you're looking for services like 3D printing and injection molding, they've got you covered. And of course, they're massive supporters of the retro community. So you can get an instant quote right now on their website at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 437, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for our weekly retro gaming geek out session every Friday, bringing you up to speed on what's been happening in the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last seven days. And of course, bringing you veterans of the industry onto the show each week to hear the story about their gaming past. And actually today, let's jump straight into that because we have got an absolutely massive packed podcast this week. Not one guest, but two massive names on the show this week. Yeah, so we've got the co-founder of Two Point Studios and, oh my God, they're absolutely amazing. Mark Webley and Gary Carr. You know, these guys came from the bullfrog days and like some of the fantastic titles that we absolutely love. You know, um, Syndicate? Yeah, they both worked on that. What an amazing How, how much time did you was. sink into Syndicate when you were a kid? Oh, Syndicate was like an addiction for me. Yeah. It was the um, first kind of free roaming experience. And, uh, you know, when you had that four player little squad and mm-hmm. you could take each unit off. And it was just beautiful as well. And the fact that, you know, it ran on the Amiga was, was pretty amazing. But also, you know, some of the add ons, it, it was a multi system game as well came out for the pc there was that snes version as well which yeah. was uh, uh rather weird but also there's a, another game there uh you know theme park yeah i might and, heard of that uh, yeah 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 it's quite big <laughs> and theme hospital of course which oh my god theme hospital was one of those titles that it was just addictive mm. like you could just pick it up and play at any time and just completely get engrossed and yeah originally would think what a boring subject a hospital um you know how are you going to turn this <laughs> into a fun game but they really did it at bullfrog it's really interesting hearing their stories as well because um they got really interesting history i mean gary actually started working at palace software yeah and i think the first game we worked on was barbarian which obviously was a massive title to jump straight in on and then when they were working at bullfrog um, mark was kind of in charge of doing the ports to other systems like you mentioned the um the version of syndicate on the snes that was very cartoony looking actually wasn't it a bit more in the vein of theme park same with theme park as well yeah Yeah. and i think they had that kind of style where you know on the computers it was serious and then Mm. it was a bit more cartoony on the consoles and gary actually mentions that um he wasn't a big fan of the idea of theme park when he first heard about it (laughs) but i've got a feeling maybe that changed as time went on because um as you mentioned they both founded a studio called two point that actually has been acquired by sega in recent years and Obviously, you know, they worked on the theme games back at Bullfrog, and their recent title is a real a real spiritual successor to Theme Hospital in particular, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, Two Point Hospital's been out for quite a while, but Two Point Campus has kind of extended the world and, you know, yeah. brought new people in. And uh, we talk about that, like, connection with nostalgia and the older game and, you know, the stuff that worked. Why, why kind of bring it back and uh, why have a new audience and why are people like Sega interested and... These new games are just fantastic. They've, they've got some other stuff in the pipeline, but uh, we also cover Fable as well. Um, yeah. There's so much in this interview. I think <laughs> you guys are really going to love it. Yeah, Fable obviously going to be celebrating its uh, 20th anniversary 
in a couple of months' time, which uh, kind of blew their mind when I pointed that out to them. And uh, obviously, Fable 4 is kind of in the pipeline at the moment. So we'll talk a bit about that. And, you know, they're not involved in it, but it's always nice to hear, you know, the guys that kind of started the franchise, how they feel about the new games coming out and the direction that it could be going in. So, uh, yeah, two massive guests on the show this week, Mark Webley and Gary Carr, who are Bullfrog alumni and now, of course, involved in uh, Sega, working with their incredible studio, Two Point. They're going to be on the show in around half an hour from now. But before that, let's have a little catch up about what's been happening in retro from over the last week, because there has been some massive stories landing on our social timelines over the last seven days, including something that I think everybody has wanted since this game first appeared. Now, of course, we're going to be talking about um, a Sonic the Hedgehog game that's getting a port to a classic Sega system. And it's the one that everybody wanted. Sonic Mania could be coming to the Dreamcast by the looks of it. This might get me to play it. <laughs> Have you still You've not played, played it? it? Oh, God. I've not played Sonic Mania. When did it come out? 2018? Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. I, I played it. Um, I, I'm, I'm lying. I have played it for about an hour. So I have it because I played it on one of our After Hours episodes many years ago. Yeah, you And did. I remember really enjoying it. But the first couple of levels are essentially clones, aren't they? They're kind of like remakes of the original levels. And I remember Ravi saying kind of like, oh, mate, you got to carry on with it. It all goes mm. crazy. And I, and I haven't carried on with it yet. You know, life gets in the way. And that does surprise me and disappoint me, Joe. Yeah, I know. And in, in, interestingly, they did Sonic Origins a couple of years later, mm. you know, where it was the original games and they kind of spruced up the graphics and everything and put them out on modern consoles. And I played that to death. I did everything in that. <laughs> yeah. So it makes no sense. It's, well, it's funny because whenever you hear about Sonic Mania, fans of like the traditional Sonic games always write that as like the best one. Well, ever. famously, you know, this was the one that Sega bought Christian Whitehead on board, yeah, yeah. who'd done some absolutely amazing mods before and, uh, you know, Ported kind of embraced... iPhone and stuff, didn't it? Yeah, it embraced, yeah. Em- embraced the fans. And uh, mm-hmm. that's what made Sonic Mania such a standout title. And, you know... It, it had a lot of that old style and um, I think the Dreamcast was perfectly capable of running it. I actually ran it uh, on the Wii U, um, yeah, which is pretty mad, but that was a uh, part of this, which is a decompilation of Sonic Mania. So um, it's been kind of decompiled. Um, of course you need the original files and the original mm. assets, um, but this has also happened to Sonic CD, Sonic 1 and 2. So, um, you know, you might see Sonic CD on the Dreamcast. If it's not already there, I'm not quite sure of the Dreamcast library. But um, they've posted a capture of it. So what they're actually doing is they're using a a thing called Callisti OS, which is uh, basically uh, an operating system and a way of porting stuff. So they're using a software development kit in there. Some games Mm -hmm. have been ported. Um, They're kind of running the assets over a network at the moment. So they've got a virtual file system on the network that they're capturing the assets from and then, you know, outputting it into the Dreamcast. So at the moment, it's very much in the form of a, you know, a kind of a patch and a, and a hack, but it's it's running well. And mm. um, hopefully they'll be able to do a way that you could purchase the original game and then, you know, somehow connect it up to a, a kind of build that will then build it for your for your Dreamcast. Yeah, we're talking about that a, while, well, a couple of weeks ago, weren't we, with um, some of these other decompilation tools where, yeah, it's literally that, isn't it? If you've got the original ROM file or an ISO file, you can basically put that in and then it yeah. will churn out working code that works on the, the system you, you intend it for. So hopefully it'll be something as simple as that, like a, a patch tool. Yeah, so it's Sonic Freak 94 who are the guys behind this, that's the team name, who've been working on this um, amazing-looking Sonic menu port to the Dreamcast. And uh, there's a guy on X called Falco Gurgis who's posted this video, a short little teaser, it's only about a minute long, but showing it running on a Dreamcast emulator. And I think, you know, look at the frame rate on that. I mean, it looks like the the Dreamcast is not even breaking a sweat, which makes sense. I mean, you know, the Dreamcast was, a you know, first of all, a 3D system, wasn't it? So it makes sense that it could do... These kind well, of well, that's the thing about these de- decompilations. They, yeah. you know, all the API, you just need to hook that up and then basically you can run it on whichever system. You know, mm. um, you need to make sure there's not like bugs and clashes and stuff like that. So they're probably going to go through, clean it up, clean up the code 
And, you know, if any community can do that, it's going to be the Dreamcast, isn't it? Because yeah. they're so used to modifying and creating games. And I love that fans have already started to produce box art. <laughs> which, <Yeah. laughs> which is just uh, totally Dreamcast straight away. Yeah, there's a, another fan of this. Yeah, he's made a uh, Dreamcast style, very similar to the Shenmue cardboard sleeve that you mm. got for the Dreamcast. But it's the Sonic Mania yellow sleeve and, you know, it's the Japanese style clamshell it game. Looks awesome. And yeah. it looks awesome. The artwork he's done and everything is just absolutely fantastic. Like that real 90s vibe as well. And there's all like stickers and stuff that come with it, which is amazing that they these people are whipping this up this quick as well. I know this has been mm. being made for a while, but yeah, man, this this does look awesome. Uh, I hope that this does become something tangible. So maybe it, maybe it'll be like a cool boot disc style thing where you know you put it in and then you put the Sonic Mania original in from another system. And then, I don't know if they can get that to work. But <laughs> I don't think that really would cool. work. Can yeah. you imagine? <laughs> you know, because to me, this is really cool to see because Sonic Mania always kind of felt like, you know, like the lost Sonic game that should have come out on the old systems. It yeah. never did. Yeah. I mean, ideally looking at this, I thought it would have been great on the Mega Drive. But then if you play Sonic Mania, you know, like you said, those early levels are kind of recreations or kind of upgrades of the, the original Sonic levels. But then something will happen or an effect will happen or something like that. And you'll look at it and you'll think, yeah, the Mega Drive couldn't have done that. So there are certain bits yeah. in the game that definitely wouldn't have been possible. Yeah, and, the and they had like, you know, Sonic Adventure, of course, and, and the original Sonic on the Dreamcast. Um, but, you know, uh, Sonic Adventure 2 as well. But having having a kind of modern, you know, 2D title is, mm. is kind of fit, well-fitting. And, and I, I can imagine this is going to hit the Saturn as well. Um, you, you know, think? as soon as the Dreamcast has done hit the Saturn, guys will be like, right, get on it. That would be cool to see, because obviously the, the Saturn is uh, the system that famously didn't really get a decent Sonic game on it, so that would be good to see. But I think in an ideal world, because I'm looking at these like screenshots of you know the fan packaging and stuff that's been made up, it would be amazing if Sega were as chill as like, you know, Atari have been recently, and maybe let one of the indie studios or maybe even work with the guys behind this and put this out as like a, you know, a physical Dreamcast game. I think they you get just, a lot of love for doing that. You just don't know with, Son with uh, I was going to say with Sonic, you just don't know with Sega at the moment, do you? Because they used to be pretty chill and cool with yeah. the, these kind of things. As da as Ravi said earlier on, you know, they brought, I forget his name. What's his name? Christian Whitehead. Yeah. There we go. They brought him on board from him doing ports and stuff for the iPhone and they brought him in to work on Sonic Mania. Whereas now... You know, Sega is shutting down fan projects and stuff. I, so I just think it's do they care about the Dreamcast that much? Is there that many people that are going to sell it, or is it just going to be? I, I guess all Sega would have to know. say is, yeah, do it. Have go ahead. Got a permission. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. Which I think you know, in terms of effort for them, wouldn't say much. But I think, but, in but terms that of, might become like you know the the official Sega release of Dreamcast. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the first one. That's a headline yeah. grabber, isn't it? Well, exactly. Yeah, I think it'd yeah. get them a lot of positive attention. I think if they did that, even if people didn't buy it, it looks it's a cool thing for Sega to do for the retro community. I think so. And it would be awesome to see. So fingers crossed. But um, as it stands at the moment, obviously a, a very unofficial fan port. But we'll keep an eye on that. If you want to check out that little teaser trailer, I'll put that in the show notes as well. Now, something else you spotted this week, Joe, and uh, we're actually having a bit of a debate about this in our uh, our Facebook group earlier on. Like, is this retro? And you pointed out that, uh, yeah, actually, it came out 18 years ago. Wow. <laughs> uh, this is Dead Rising. It's basically getting a remake. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a weird discussion, a weird topic. I'm a big fan of Dead Rising. Huge fan as well, yeah. Yeah. I absolutely and, uh, love it. Yeah. Funny enough, me and Ravi were talking about it once again in the After Hours last week, weren't mm. we? And... Yeah, straight up, is it retro? <laughs> because of its obviously an Xbox 360 game that came out in August 2006. So it's 18 years old next month. Um, Which, you know, you think when we started this podcast, like coming up on nine years ago, we'd have covered stuff from 18 years previous and it wouldn't have felt there'd, be, there'd yeah. have been no debate, you know, if we'd have talked about a game that I came did, out. I, I, I plug in a 360 and the noise on that thing, the kind of size of it as well. I think, yeah, yeah this is an old console. Yeah, know? it gives you nostalgia as well, doesn't yeah. it? But yeah, you're right there, Dan. Like when we started out, the Dreamcast had only been discontinued 15 years prior. Well, okay, we so had... 18 years before we started this podcast was 1998. Exactly. So we, we'd have talked about stuff from 98, no problem. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So we can talk about Dead Rising. Of course we can. So, so this has uh, been announced earlier this week, the Dead Rising 
Deluxe Remaster, which will be coming out on September 19th, uh, 2024, and was announced at a Capcom show this week. And it's going to be coming out, interestingly, on all consoles, so PS5, Xbox Series X, Steam, etc. Not a Switch, interestingly. But obviously, the other week I was talking about the uh, Marvel vs. Capcom re-release, which isn't coming out on Xbox. So I don't really know what Capcom are playing up with there. But I wonder if the Switch may be, because I mean, the Switch is getting a bit long in the tooth now, and obviously we're waiting yeah. for like a Switch 2 any day now, you know, at some point this year. Yeah. So maybe it's just it physically couldn't cope with the, the remastered graphics, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, but it's interesting that they've called it, I like that they've called it, you know, DRDR, so Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. But while they were on stage, Capcom have said, actually, we have actually built this game again from the ground up, so it is more of a remake, the director of the game has said. Yeah, it, hmm. it seemed like, you know, the way they'd remade Crash Bandicoot. Um, yes. Where Spot they've on. kept all the original like assets and the original yep. character models and, and styles and levels, um, but they've kind of given it a, a shine. Yeah, they've built over it. They haven't just gone, okay, we're going to polish the graphics. It's as if they've built over the graphics and stuff. And it's more environmental stuff, isn't it? So, like, yeah. um, one of the things that I was noticing in the preview was they were talking about the different times of day. Um, yeah. The mall always felt a bit, like, trapped in one period of time. Yes. And, you know, having sun go up and down and sunsets and stuff, it, it's going to change the whole vibe of it, um, yeah. especially when there's zombies in, in the darkness. Um and to keeping the levels the same, there's some. I forgot how good some of the bosses in Dead Rising are, and just like you know, seeing this trailer again, I'm like, oh my god, that that clown dude, you know, <laughs> like Hell. there was so many, so many cool characters and, and wicked levels. I'm glad they've kept that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited for it. Apparently, there has been some quality of life changes to it. I did go back because they did make a remaster of this game already in 2016, which right. they do point out in the preview, in the trailer for it. And I went back and played that over lockdown in 2020 and it hadn't aged too well. It is very clunky, the original yeah. Dead Rising. Like, the control... See, that's funny to hear because I, I played it actually briefly. I remember on After Hours we were talking about, I, I didn't think I played it, but then I saw it in my collection. Yeah. I was like, I have got this game. And I did remember then playing it, I think I only played it once. When yeah. I first got my 360, for some reason, never went back to it. Oh, but in my really. mind, it's kind of looking back then, and those games feel like they've got basically modern game controls. So I wouldn't have thought it would have aged that well, badly. Well, also, I think, you know, the, the intelligence of the zombies is going to change. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's going to make it a different game in, in the way you play it. Dead Rising, you could trick them quite easily. <laughs> you know, yeah. You'd, yeah. like, run around a pillow and jump on something, and they're gone. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> this one, I can imagine they're going to be lurching for you more. They're going to be, and, like, in places you don't expect. And it's interesting that you just said that because of, obviously, a big aspect of Dead Rising is saving survivors. And as mm. you just said, Ravi, you'd have a survivor following you and you'd run around a pillar and you'd lose them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just be like, oh, the come AI. on. Yeah, and you'd yeah, have and to go back and fight them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then bring your survivor through. Yeah, escort and, them. Yeah, yeah and you that. could you could actually have up to eight survivors following you at once. And there was achievements linked to that. And I remember trying to completely like platinum this game, get all the achievements and just having an absolute nightmare with the survivors following me and them just getting ripped apart by zombies. So, as they've said, quality of life improvements. So, I think you're right there, Ravi. I think the AI, etc., may be a bit better this time this around. This might give me a whole reason to actually buy one of these modern, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> uh, consoles. Yeah. Is it, it coming out on Steam then? There's no, no Steam. It's on Steam. Right? It is on Steam. Is, uh, yeah, yeah, I wanna, yeah. Yeah. If you're playing Dead Rising, you've got to do it in your living room, though. And, yeah. You know. Drag your gaming PC down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, I don't even yeah. have that. I've got a Mac, so I'm completely screwed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. Any idea on release date on that yet? Do we know? Uh, 19th just... of September. Okay, so not long to wait, end of the summer. Yeah. So you want to check out what we know so far? I'll put that in the show notes as well. Now, you did mention that you love getting your achievements there, Joe. Yeah, you make no secret about the fact you're a bit of a an achievement chaser. Must be honest, I've never been that bothered about trophies and achievements and stuff. I mean, you know, when they pop up on screen, sometimes I'm like, oh, cool. Um, it's, but yeah, it's nothing I've been majorly into. I know you've always talked. You've actually played games again and bought them on new systems just to get the achievements, haven't you? Yeah, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of sad. Like, and it's funny because of um, I am an achievement hunter, and it kind of ruined gaming for me for a while. 
because of I only wanted to play modern games mm. to, you know, hunt achievements. Games I liked. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, one of my friends would buy terrible games which have easy achievements on them just so we can get a thousand points with my first hour. pony. Yeah. Those kinds of games where it's, like, <laughs> yeah. where it's like, play the game, 500 points, like really yeah. silly stuff. And going off on a tangent here before we talk about the news story, but a few years ago, a friend of mine was like, bro, nobody cares. Nobody's checking your gamer score, et cetera. Like, and I was like, you know what? He's right. And, and I really got back into playing retro and stuff. And then I went on a stag do last year and everybody was adding each other on Xbox. And right. somebody went, yo, Foxy's got a hundred thousand points on Xbox. That's insane. And I was like, what, what? <laughs> Like, I've got street cred again. <laughs> I've got street cred again, like a load of 30-year-old blokes. Get blokes well, one one thing that was quite amazing is, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd just been playing on Steam. Steam's got a really good achievement system as well. And you earn all these cards and stuff like that. And I was just like looking through it one day and I was like, wow, I've got a lot. And then yeah. I'm like, these are actually worth money. And you can sell them on like an open market as well. So oh, really? Don't get into Steam, Joe. <laughs> That'll be the I end won't. of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's be funny though, because because my little nephew, he like he lives on Xbox. And yeah, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, my brother and him, we were having like a, an online game, playing something, and he was he like you know ribbing me for my Xbox gamer score. I'm like, I didn't even know what it was. I was thinking like eight thousand or something probably. I've been on there like twenty years. Yeah, and he's like ripping me, and I'm like, yeah. Well, how how long have you been playing this over the weekend? He goes, oh, I was on eighteen hours on Saturday. I'm like, I probably yeah. haven't gamed eighteen hours of this year. Yeah, yeah. So wish, I, wish I had time to play games. Yeah, <laughs> I work. Um, how, how many hours have you got? Oh, an hour this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, however, if you do want to combine yep. the best of both worlds, and uh, here's an excuse if you're a bit of an achievement hunter and you want to play your retro games and get a bit of recognition from the achievement system for doing it, the GameCube is getting achievements thanks to the Dolphin emulator. Yeah, so this is a well-known GameCube emulator called the Dolphin emulator, which is named after the the dolphin the gamecube's kind of like secret name wasn't it was the dolphin code name prototype code here. name yeah and this is an update that is coming to uh, the dolphin emulator on the 15th of July which is going to incorporate a retro achievements system so in the emulation there will be built in achievements at the moment Quite a handful of games, standout games being Super Mario Sunshine, Smash Bros, Wario World, F-Zero, Rogue Squadron, a couple of other games on there. But it's not gonna make it's not gonna draw me back in because it's it's you know, even though like I say I'm a sucker for achievements, it's through emulation. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess you're gonna yeah. need some like connectivity. And this isn't just available for Dolphin as well. This retro achievements is uh win arcadia retro arch as well which i think is a huge one you mm. know um because you've got so many supported systems on there um yeah you know having that connection on retro arch is is massive uh ravdb uh ra snares uh 9x as well um it goes on the list as basically right. so it looks like that the uh, pc sx2 as well the playstation 2 emulator it looks like it's becoming this third party achievement for you know, retro gamers and and people on emulators. I think maybe with online connectivity and these these weird little networks that are getting created at the moment, there might be a way of integrating. I think it will be pretty hard to do. And uh, I kind of like the idea that you've got this database that's maintained separately, so you can get all of those achievements and then connect them on, you know, whichever emulator you're using. And it looks like it's going to grow. They're adding more games to the list as well. Yeah, they're going to add more games to the list, which is cool. So there will be people adding to this constantly by the looks of things. But it'd be interesting just to kind of be like, what's your gamer score? And you go, oh, what, on Xbox? You go, no, on your GameCube. What's your gamer <laughs> score on Super Mario Sunshine? Well, yeah, what tell that next hours? time you're out yeah. with the lads. Yeah, yeah. that would be really cool. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, Joe. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, it's cool, but the, yeah, the downside is that you've got to play it on emulation mm. to get these. And I think, because I wonder, I mean... I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, there's a way of doing it, I imagine, but I've never seen it. Getting the GameCube online. I, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that was a thing back in the day. It was. I, I don't think it was all that widespread, but I know the Wii, for example. And there are, you know, if you've got a modded Wii, for example, you can play GameCube games on it. And obviously, mm -hmm. the Wii is an online collective console, and there are third party servers for that yeah, now. That you can well, they might, they might just do an add on for that. You know, it's third party, so they could just add on that but i also think you know you're kind of underestimating 
amount of people that have a little box with everything on it that has retro arch that they just play on in their living room and don't have all these older systems and i think this is perfect for that yeah definitely but yeah if they could build it into the wii um kind of homebrew scene so you could play gamecube games and actually get scores on i mean it's not the original hardware again but it, it feels a bit closer than um than running it on emulation i think uh, but yeah, cool to see. I think uh, you know, for the people that are into achievements, very cool. If this was available on like you know original hardware, Joe, somehow would, would you go back and play all your games again to build that score? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a question. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> My GameCube set up anyway. Um, yeah, with uh, the Resident Evil games out, so um, you know that does get played every now and then when mm. I'm in the old office when I'm meant to be doing some work. Um, so yeah, it probably would draw me in to be honest. <laughs> In a way, though, then your missus can look at it and be like, hang on, you've been... Pl- the achievements give it away, don't they? How long have you been spending on your system? Oh, she wouldn't know how to yeah. check that. I don't think she knows how to check it on Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to text her the instructions. Um, so, yeah, very cool, though. If you want to uh, check out more about that, I will link that in the show notes as well. And we're going to be talking to uh, this week's special guests coming up in just a moment, Mark Webley and Gary Carr. And a little reminder as well that we do have a, uh, a patron for this podcast as well, that if you'd uh, like to support us on there, you get the normal podcast extended each week. we put a couple of extra news stories in there. We've got a couple coming up just for our patrons. You get it ad-free as well, and also you get invited to our wonderful patrons hangouts, of which we had another really good one last weekend. Uh, there will be another one at the end of this month, so if you'd like to support the show, all the details to join us on Patreon are on the website at theretrohour.com. So it's one quick story following on from something we were talking about um, either last week or the week before. We are talking about that resurrected Sega Neptune console that's coming out of that Brazilian company, Gamescare. So uh, the big news is they're actually making an exclusive game for it. So first of all, Joe, for people that miss the episode, remind us what this is, this system. So there is a Brazilian company, as many of you may know, there is Tectoy in Brazil who still produce classic Sega consoles, such as the Master System, uh, due to like licensing laws and, uh, you know, export laws in Brazil. Um, but this is a new company that are going to be creating a FPGA, Sega Neptune, which is going to be called the GF1 Neptune, uh, which is a, it's based on the Sega Neptune prototype, but it will play original hardware so mega drive games and 32x games which is what the neptune was meant to be and they did a neo geo consoleized as well previously. yes they did yeah. that's what they did before and it will also i believe it was going to have like wi-fi and it was going to have an sd card port on it and stuff like that uh, but now what they're saying is this is going to be an exclusive game for the sega neptune as well which i think is a little bit of a clickbait if you read into it mm. so this game is called sword of the apocalypse um which to just touch on the game a little bit does look like a really nice mega drive game very akin to shinobi side along platformer very fast very nice parallax scrolling really detailed graphics pixel graphics good music as well very nice. really good music mm. parallax scrolling and all that kind of stuff nice and colorful um but if you read into it it says that it will play on the mega drive as well <laughs> it'll play on the standard mega drive so, so not w- doesn't require the 32x it doesn't require the 32X or this new Neptune GF1. <laughs> but, but I guess I might have mega features for it and they might hold yes. back the release, you know. Yes, so you are right. So there will be, it will have an enhanced version on the cartridge. Right, okay. So if yeah, you yeah. play it on, the, on the, the Neptune GF1 or the 32X, you will get enhanced graphics, colours, etc. But it will run on standard on the mega drive as well which is quite cool because i feel like that would have been quite a unique selling point for the 32x games back in the day if they'd done something similar that you Mm. know they could i can't see why they couldn't have done that maybe it would have been too cost costly um you know in the 90s to have done that but game wise it looks cool i just thought it was a bit of a funny headline it looks really good actually it does look good it does look really good and i wonder if it will become one of these extremely rare expensive yeah, I, thought, I was just thinking, good luck getting this outside yeah. of Brazil in, in, you know, physical yeah. form. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, though, because, I mean, there are some people, there is a bit of a thread going on on, uh, on X right now. They put the trailer on there, um, and someone instantly replied to it and said, um, it looks like the sprites have been taken from a DS game oh. called uh, Naruto versus Sasuke, apparently. Right, okay. And then the, the developers replied to that saying, sorry, I've never heard of that game before. 
and mm. then yeah so maybe there's i don't know if some of the people involved in that are in this or it's a coincidence maybe Ooh. i'm looking at the screenshot side by side does look very similar I've got Ooh, to that's say. That's interesting. Um, but um, I mean, it could just be a placeholder, maybe. Maybe some of them are going to change at some point. But yeah, that's interesting to see. Might have to look into um, that. Ooh. Yeah. So, I mean, I agree. I think to me, this, uh, I mean, I looked at it first of all and I thought, yeah, that looks like it could run on a, a standard Mega Drive. It looks like a decent modern Mega Drive game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're obviously only showing the standard 16 bit version at the moment. Um, and they are saying there will be some 32X enhancements for this new system. <laughs> Either way, I think it is cool that they're um, not only kind of add into the 32X library, which, as we know, wasn't all that big, but um, actually making you know reasons for people to buy this new FPGA system, I think, having an exclusive game library. And very cool, you know, if they put it out so all 32X owners can play it, I think that will yeah. be even better. But, um, yeah, I think it is good to see. I think, you know, if uh, if this does sell well in, in, um, in Brazil, uh, because we did a bit of a kind of a look at Brazil on the podcast about five years ago, and we had the guys from Tech Toy on, didn't we, Ravi? You were talking to them and yeah. uh, kind of talking about the Sega scene out there. And it is really like a its own bubble, really, isn't it? We yeah, kind of, I, I, I yeah. don't, you know, I've heard ups and downs about Tech Toys licensing at the moment yeah. and if they've dropped it or, or right. kind of what's going on in the recent years. But, you know, there is a whole Brazilian scene that um, we're not aware of and some mad stuff keeps coming out of there. And this is interesting to see. I like that they're launching a console with a launch title as well and some... Uh, a little bit of exclusivity. Yeah, and I mean, maybe if Tech Toy not doing it anymore, maybe that's why these guys have come in. Yeah, To kind maybe. of take their place. Yeah. Fill the vacuum. Um, yeah, you always hear that, you know, Brazil is kind of the land where Sega never went away. Um, so, uh, yeah, very cool. Something else we'll be keeping an eye of if you want to check out that trailer. And, of course, all the rest of the stories, you don't have to Google around. I save you the job every week. Just check the notes section of your podcast app or head to the website. You can click straight through to all the stories from there at theretrohour.com. All right, now, before we chat to this week's special guests in just a moment, let's take a quick second to give a massive thank you to this week's sponsor, and this is our wonderful friends at ExpressVPN. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know if you guys are the same, you kind of look at your um, your bills every month, kind of feels like Netflix announced a price hike, like every three or four months at the moment. Yeah, and yeah like pretty, much, pretty much doubled since I signed up about 10, 15 years ago. And the thing is... If you're spending this amount of money on streaming services, I haven't dared add this up because my missus does like Paramount Plus. She does Disney Plus, no, Amazon Prime we've got with Netflix, all these random ones I've never heard of. Lionsgate was one, Stars Play. I've never heard of those. Yeah. Random show. <laughs> She's addicted. Yeah. You name it, Dan's got it. <laughs> exactly, whether I want to or not. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, if you're the same, if you, you know, because you all add up, don't they? I remember. Years ago, it was the the, uh, the cable cutting scene, they called it. You know, getting rid of, like, Sky or NTL. Yeah, yeah, version cut, cut the cord, there. you know. Um, yeah, yeah save everything's going to be cheaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but definitely isn't now. I mean, you know, it's easy to spend, like, up to £100 a month on all these services, even more than a, a Virgin Media subscription, for example. So if you are paying all that money, there is something incredible that Netflix has got more than 18,000 titles globally, but there is only something like around 6,000 of them available here in the UK. So you're literally paying for shows and missing out on thousands of libraries of shows that you could be watching, unless you use our sponsor, ExpressVPN. Now, ExpressVPN not only makes it you know worth your while, you know, works with you to save your money and get value on these streaming services, but it's so easy to use as well, isn't it? Because really, the way it does it is it changes your location. Yeah, so you can kind of access new content and you know, change which country you're in, which basically means it thinks you're in another place. You can mm. pick your movie that's not available yeah. in other ones. Well, they've got servers in over 100 countries around the world. So that means thousands of new shows and never run out of stuff to watch. You'd be watching some on, you, whenever we talk to you, you're like, oh, I've been watching so-and-so on the Brazilian Netflix or Canadian, what you've been watching this week. I, I assume you've been doing that again this I week. I was going to do an impression of it. Any of you beeping, beep, move, and I'll beep every beep. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Nicely said. <sentenced>. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just uh, such a good movie. Uh, massively stylized, uh, Quentin Tarantino yeah, classic. classic. You know, uh, one of my favorites, Pulp Fiction. And you forget, like, how many iconic scenes are in that. And uh, that is only available on Netflix Japan, amazingly. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, been checking that out. But also... City of God as well, seeing that we've been talking about Brazil. 
And, uh, you know, City of God is a very gritty tale about, um, you know, Rio de Janeiro and the slums and uh, uh, crime, drugs, and um, Rocket as well, who's, who's one of the main characters. And uh, it's kind of like the the downfall of an area and a, and a young photographer captures it all. And it's uh, based on a true story as well, which is pretty amazing. If you've not seen City of God, I recommend it, but it's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah. <laughs> Both of those films are for the faint-hearted, actually. So, again, I mean, you hear about these, and, you know, a lot of them aren't on British or American services, but they are on Netflix libraries around the world. It doesn't just work with Netflix either, Disney+, Plus, BBC iPlayer, lots more as well. Dead easy to use, literally the press of a button, isn't it? And works on all your devices, your phone, yep. smart TV apps as well, your computer, consoles, and they're completely encrypted. And actually, blazing fast speeds as well, streaming HD, no buffering, nothing like that. So if you want to try out ExpressVPN and get value for money on these streaming services that we're paying for every month, why don't you give ExpressVPN a try? It pays for itself. So use our link, expressvpn.com slash retro. And of course, we've got your great offer. Using that link, they'll know that we sent you, helps out the podcast, and you'll also get an extra three months for free on top of a one-year plan. So go to expressvpn.com slash retro, and a massive thank you to our friends at ExpressVPN for their continued support. All right, the next two massive guests on the show talking about the Bullfrog days and, of course, their incredible new studio that's now part of Sega Two Point with our special guest, Mark Webley and Gary Carr, next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and we're here with Mark Webley and Gary Carr. And they're, you know, bullfrog chums back in the days, but they've come to found a brand new studio and a a fantastic studio, actually. A lot of people really love their games. Two points. And, uh, you know, with the Retro Hour, we've always got a question that we ask our guests first. And, uh, you know, you guys are going to have to decide who takes it first. I'd say, well, probably Gary. What was your first computer experience that you ever had? I guess... Like most people, I think we had the grandstand it tennis game, plug in play, back of the TV. That would have been in the sort of 70s, mid 70s, something like that. Paul, you know, on game. And I was living in a seaside town, so we had lots of arcades around. So I was lucky to play lots of cool games. I suppose the earliest I remember were things like Shark Attack, which wasn't even really computer graphics, it was projected, backlit picture show really with a gun you shot sharks with i think it came out around about the time jaws came to cinema about 76 and then i guess the more sophisticated games came along so i played a lot of well i played space attack which was the knockoff version of space invaders but i think it was a better game i thought the waves were a bit better and then my favorite probably not long after that was tempest and i played a lot of missile Command, was it Missile Command or Missile, missile Attack? Command. Yeah, America. with the rollerball, which yeah, obviously yeah. used to blister your hand if you got it, your skin <laughs> caught down the side. Uh, well, yeah. that's what happens when you've got baggy skin on your hands. Yeah, I do have baggy skin. I've got notoriously <laughs> saggy fingers. You so happen. I used to... <laughs> People are going to be picturing that in their head now. <laughs> so it sounds like you spent a lot of time in the arcade then back then, Gary. I mean, uh, well, yeah, y- yeah, if I, if, yeah, I did. I mean, seaside towns in the winter are quite dull. So, mm. yeah, I used to go down the arcades. So, in fact, I was more of a gamer then than I probably ended up being <laughs> in, <laughs> for a job. But, yeah, I like a lot of teenage and, and slightly younger kids. I love going down the arcades because it's just, you yeah, know, hang out. What about you then, Mark? How did you get the bug for it, Mark? Yeah, well, it was not dissimilar. I grew up in a different seaside town in, in down in Folkestone, and uh, there was amusement arcades all over the place. So I do. I remember having this uh, playing on anything. You know, if I had some money, I would go on uh, an arcade machine, which would be a game, and then also the gambling uh, machines, all on bandits. And I sort of came to a realization that I just don't know why I was going on these money winning machines the potential of the lure of winning some money and and never doing so and they just focused on um the games and uh they're brilliant I, the ones i remember really liking at the time was a game called boot hill and mm. uh it was i just kids kept playing that over and over when I, when i could and i'm not even sure when that was it was um but it used to go do 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 if you if you're dead. So it was that was quite a, a good game and sort of had the Pac Man stuff. And then I guess later on, uh, my brother got um, 
a ZX Spectrum. And uh, mm. so I, I had to play on that. I wasn't a programmer, but I typed in from one of the magazines uh, one of the programs. It took all day coding in something from a mag- magazine used to print out code listings. And, you know, that certainly um, – I had to switch it all off at the end of the day, so that was pretty uh, – pretty disappointing but it was it was fun and uh, i guess that was it really I, I nobody had computers some kids had uh the real nerdy kids at school had some programmable calculators and they could yeah. kind of program little games on them but you know, that was way above me at that time so yeah well let's talk about our own like personal first home systems and do you remember yours mark what you got then your uh, after your brother's spectrum oh i guess probably an amiga i guess Yes. Mm. Yeah. Nice. An Amiga 500. I guess that's a proper computer. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was pretty, pretty powerful. I'm not sure I had anything before that, really. What about you, Gary? No. You, even though I'm a little younger than Mark, not much, but a little younger, I, I started a, quite a bit earlier. <laughs> so I, I worked on 8 bit games. So I worked on the, as Mark said, the Spectrum, Amstrad, CPC, and, the Commodore 64, even the um, IBM green screens and the BBC Acorn, those kind of things. So I was sort of around the mid-80s I started. So I didn't have a machine before that. In fact, I failed computer graphic. I'm, I'm an artist, by the way, and, uh, originally. I was an artist animator, and I, I failed computer graphics at art school because I couldn't be bothered waiting for all my stuff to render out. It took like a month for anything to, you know, eventually get printed. So I just didn't bother doing it. So I didn't really have the the inclination to go and make a career out of computers. But Mm. when I started, I was just blown away by how quickly you could make things. Luckily, I had some really, really good people around me who did built some really cool editors. So we were building games quite quickly. From, from you know, from literally idea to completion in three months, which now just seems ridiculous on all sorts of different formats as well. So, all those um, I suppose first machines that a lot of people of our age would have got for Christmas, I was lucky enough to get paid to play with them. So nice. <laughs> well, let's talk about your entry into the industry, then. So I know you started working with uh, Palace Software, and uh, you worked on the you know, legendary game Barbarian. So, how did you get your foot in the door with them, and what was it like working on that game? made a couple of films, four films at art school. Two were animated films, two were live action films. And I applied for a job at Palace Films, who made things like um, A Company of Wolves, When Harry Met Sally. And they used to distribute movies like Evil Dead. They did things like Razor Head. And they were just a really kind of cool indie film company. And I thought I was applying for a film role, but they put me in the games team. And it all started there, really. So I accidentally got a game, a, a job in computer games rather than movies. And, it's all and, yeah. been a series of accidents, really. <laughs> My life is a series of wrong doors, really, taking the wrong door, but then and then it working out to be the right door in the end. But yeah, uh, that was it. But there were so many talented people back then. I'll just call out a few because you know people like Dan Malone, you know Stan Skenbury, Richard Linefelder, so many Joe Walker. There were so many fantastic talented people who we were just given the keys to the creative door i mean uh, you know there wasn't anybody telling us what to do we were just told to go and have fun and see if we could make something out of these little computer systems because it was a very punk rock company palace i mean they were kind of co-owned or they came out of virgin effectively and because virgin was set up by doing exactly that just publishing some pieces of music that went on to make them millions they wanted games to be that next, if you like, way for success. So mm. we were just given freedom to do anything. We were young, so we looked right. <laughs> we looked kind of cool, and and there was no censorship. It just didn't exist back then. You could do anything, and nobody questioned what your content was. So Barbarian, we just exploited sexuality. We exploited horror, and no one was going to tell us not to. So... I'm not saying it was the most politically correct game in the world, but mm. every 14-year-old boy, because <laughs> it was boys then, yeah. wanted it. You know, they wanted the poster more than the game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, that, and that was the kind of 
you know idea behind virgin as well like you said punk and you know with them promoting exactly. the pistols and stuff and that exactly yeah exactly. going into into video games world. I, I remember playing nine inch nails too loud one day and richard leinfelder was technically my boss but there wasn't really bosses it was who shouted the loudest to be honest <clears throat> and i think he was one year older than me at the time i think he was 21 and i was 20 and he literally he obviously planned it he ejected the cassette <laughs> because I was playing it really loud. And he he literally took it out of the cassette player. He got a nine-inch nail. <laughs> and he, <laughs> this is just the, uh, you know, the, the, the wonderful poetic justice. And he just nailed it into the wall. <laughs> he said, I'll give you nine-inch nails. <laughs> that was kind of, you know, I remember looking after another guy's plant for two weeks when it was on holiday and getting berated for it. So, and it, it actually improved and looked beautiful. And then at the end of it, they just got lighter fuel out and just set it on fire. Oh, wow. It was just kind of like that. It wasn't, there was nobody really in charge of the children. So we just did what we wanted to do. But we, it was a really creative time and, and some of the best fun I'd ever had. Well, well Mark, how, how did you get involved with the video game world? And also, do, do you remember the first time you met Gary? I remember the first time I saw Gary. I mean, my... my uh, root was basically I uh, did maths and computing at university and then uh, I got a well in fact I did in my industrial year at IBM and realized I didn't want to be a programmer so I tried to get a creative job um, and I applied to about 20 different um, advertising agencies and um, they're all kind of like if you, you know, analyze this this advert and you know, write this and write that and all 20 of them none of them even um replied and rejected me so i ended up getting a job programming business software but and that was actually i quite enjoyed that and then eventually um i i had a demo i was working on a demo with um uh, a friend of mine who's who's now at well, worked at bullfrog and lionhead and he's at two point now a guy called alan wright and um we presented it to Bullfrog, and I, I think I'd met Gary before that. I don't know if you remember. You probably wouldn't remember seeing me, Gary, because I had a suit on at the time, and you couldn't see people in suits. Although you said you were, you you could. <laughs> um, Gary had a uh, like a, a mohawk, and it looked quite scary. And I was walking up this narrow staircase, and he's coming down. Yeah, he's a sweet guy, really, but he did look a bit scary. So. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, that, that's the first time I saw him at, uh, at the Bullfrog offices. Um, and my, my foray into it is I had been programming and playing games and actually making it, uh, a game which was probably based on um, a Space Hulk, you know, sort of uh, it was a turn base for Marines. I mean, we didn't have a license or anything. We were just kind of making this game up and we presented it to bullfrog and i think pretty much everyone in the studio i think it's probably about five or six of them had a look at it and talked to me and i didn't get the job uh, <clears throat> of you know i thought there might be a chance that they'd go oh this is great well we'd like to uh you'd come work here and finish it but um i got a job at bullfrog doing something different which was setting up the conversions team so um we were taking all all the games like when i joined the Pop 2 had been out, Publis 2 had been out. Yeah, on written, Amiga it had, yeah. On Amiga, yeah. So yeah. I, so that was written in Assembler. And so my first job was uh, porting it to the PC. And I don't know, you didn't work with me on that. Did you do some graphics? No, uh, we, what used to happen was I was looking – I worked with Peter primarily, but uh, Sean and Glenn tended to work independently. But I was kind of – Peter's artist and we were kind of running ahead of the next game and by the time it came to porting I suppose we were on the next one so I'd done Power you were on Monger. Power Monger I think Power Monger hadn't come out when I started so I, I think was... it had on Amiga oh maybe maybe uh, I think we did weirdly I think we didn't do the PC port till after populous 2 because that it wasn't yeah. quite as successful so it's weird order of things back then. so, so yeah. gary you were kind of focused on the amiga releases then i guess yeah that was the lead platform then and uh, then everything else went to mark for i mean mark was by the way when mark came in to show his game off i was one of the people that wanted to hire him there was a real <laughs> there was a strange thing about bullfrog then 
it didn't people didn't want it to grow and anybody coming in doesn't matter who you are you could have been Bill Gates, you wouldn't have got a job if it was left to everyone to vote. And Peter used to be quite democratic and give everyone a, a vote. And I voted that Mark could come in. But <laughs> I'm not saying who didn't vote you in, Mark. Glenn, I think, obviously. You can Glenn. imagine. Yeah, Glenn was so grumpy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, was the idea like, keep this small kind of magical kind, team together? Kind of, but there was also, I think, it was starting to become successful. And actually, it was become it become successful before I joined. Even uh, Populous had come out round about the time I joined, so I d- I worked on the data disc only at the very back end of it, like hardly touched it. The Promised Lands data disc. So they were they'd gone from having no money at all to suddenly there was money swilling around the bank account. So I think the more people that would come in, the more it would have to get. The cake would have to get carved up, I guess. So hmm. my that was my view that they were trying to keep the numbers down so they could <laughs> they could have more more of the share of the pie. That, that's probably Glenn, but I mean certainly <laughs> as, as the success came, we kind of and the teams I guess needed to get a bit bigger because you were you guys it was a tiny little um, company um, at the time, but I guess e- even now. We kind of there's something nice in in small and uh i know we're, we're not tiny small but i mean compared to some teams we are but it's it's kind of nice to be able to talk to everyone and having a small team you know, mm. four or five is quite um it's quite magical yeah by the way glenn is lovely in his one of our greatest friends we're just slightly ribbing him because just yeah. in those <laughs> early days it was it was incredibly precious and yeah. i think everybody just didn't want as to change the chemistry as well. So bringing in, and you're a bit of a grown up, Mark, actually, because I think you'd had some. I'd had a proper job, and you'd had a proper you job, had, yeah. and you were you were given a, a role that had sort of a manager kind of title as well. So I think it was just difficult. This is when you actually came in to do the head of conversions. Hmm. You're head of something. None of us yeah. had been head of anything at that point. We we're all just, you know, devs. So it, it was when. Bullfrog was starting to grow up a little bit. Its success meant, you know, all these new machines were coming out and also success in Japan. If you remember, Mark, it was like Login was basically a quite a big Japanese computer game magazine. And, Bull, and Bullfrog pretty much owned the magazine. So the Japanese people were playing lots of the early games. So that level of success meant, you know, there were lots of different skews of the game to games to go on to so mark had to sort of manage what we were going to do in house and what we would farm out to other people and things like that so in 1993 bullfrog had one of their uh, absolute classics released with the uh, the incredible syndicate back in the day and ravi's a massive fan of that so he's probably going to uh, really geek out with you guys about that in a moment but i know mark you you worked on syndicate as a as a producer on that game so what memories have you got of working on it and what were the challenges of developing that game? It was very ambitious for the time. It, it was. And, and what I did on it was one of the conversions, of course. Um, it was written on, well, in fact, it was originally being worked on on the piece, uh, the, the Amiga. And then the team, uh, Sean, Sean Cooper and, and Peter converted it over to PC, released on PC. So one of my roles was converting it. Uh, the finish game back to the Amiga because, of course, we were still supporting that. But um, Gary, I mean, you you must remember. I mean, because that predated my joining of Bullfrog, and in fact, you guys were working on that when I presented my my four Mari- space marine uh, based game. So you kind of had a <laughs> something that sli- yeah, slightly copied it. yeah slightly better than what I had. Yeah, it's like to be honest. I do you remember if it was called Syndicate then? I don't think it was. Was it Bob or Quaz? Well, before, well, there was Quaz was one name. Bob was another. The one I started was called Cyber Assault. Uh, um, so when I started on it, it was the first, very first thing I worked on at Bullfrog because Peter and the team had gone away to a game show in America. It wouldn't have been E three; it had been something prior to that. And I was just given a, a quick briefing from Peter to go and think of a squad-based four-player, actually it was four-controllable character game, squad-based game, called Cyber Assault. And he wanted it to be three sprites high. And of course, the characters ended up being very small. But back then, there were going to be quite large characters. And that 
got shelved not long after, really. We didn't do too much. I had characters running around a flat area shooting. And then um, then we put it down. And what used to happen with Syndicate was it was the game we picked up and put down when something else came along. So it went through being a, a squad-based game into a sideways scrolling platform game, and it's called Bob. And it's called Bob because it meant it stood for blue and orange bloke. And then Quaz. And then a game came out called Command and Conquer, mm. I guess. It might have been the what was before Command and Conquer? Dune something. Two. Yeah, yeah was, Dune. Dune. But yeah, yeah, was... yeah. Dune. It was Dune. So that was the real kind of inspiration for. For, for Sean to pick up the game again and go, no, we're throwing everything away and we're starting again. Because this is really his, pa- his passion was that game and later Command and Conquer, which probably came out after, but it was basically June was was also his influence, right? So he, he kind of started putting this together with Peter and they basically worked in the evenings on it, not during the day. Peter was, I think at the time, doing the pc version of power manga i'm trying if i'm getting my dates right mm. maybe even early theme park and um it was sean who was kind of doing a lot of the legwork but with peter basically coming in in the evening and going i like this more i don't like that and then getting into the coding with they they were a brilliant coding team by the way sean cooper and peter molyneux they just fed off each other smoked huge amounts of tobacco and just worked late into the night. And that game was brilliant. They were both quite feisty people, really, with each other in a, in a positive way. You know, they laughed and, and they were all kind of like challenging each other, if, whether it was squash or just, you know, who could code quicker and who was better at whatever. They were very competitive. And I think the game is that energy, really. Technically, it's insane. Um, like oh, I- what, what, what you can do on such a small system and, yeah, you know, having such a, a developed world in there. Look, yeah, I mean, these, those two were geniuses at that point in their career. I mean, you had Peter, who was probably the hardest working person I've ever worked with. I mean, he just didn't stop. And Sean Cooper, who literally could learn to do anything in about a week. I mean, he learned to play keyboards in a week. He learned to play guitar in a week. Yeah, he, I remember he, him, he, 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 his guitar playing. I remember he got himself a nice guitar learned to play really well, really quickly, and then gave it up because he said, I yeah. realised I couldn't be the best in the world. Yeah, that's what it was but like. he just gave up. He, be- he became a supermodel in a week. <laughs> Not kidding. Yeah. He did, yeah. He, he, would do any, he would do all these things. Um, he was so he was like a sponge. But I can tell you something about him. It, as, as brilliant as he was, he had no common sense or any kind of perception of what's going on in the world. I remember him saying how great it was at the time that we had a great prime minister in Margaret Thatcher. Mm. And it had been about eight months since she had left and it would have been John Major in charge <laughs> of the country. He had no idea that had happened, right? Um, but no, they were fantastic together, really good. I was, I was going to say, Mark, as well, you had like challenges uh, porting it, I guess, and, um, you know, hitting different systems like the 3DO. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, and well, also uh, Syndicate American Revolt as well, doing the... Um, kind of add-on later on yeah that was um i was working mainly with a guy called mike disquette who um who later on went to um to work uh, set up a company with gary mucky foot so that those guys worked together and uh, on the 3do as well did we do the 3do you did you did do we did 3DO. a few things on 3do it's such a you did theme park as well yeah, i don't think anyone ever bought it but but yeah no that was um uh, that, they were all tr- tricky. I mean, doing things like uh, theme park onto the SNES and the Mega Drive was kind of yes, that was stuff we did internally. And and so much of it is um, you're just starting again, rewriting chunks of code. Uh, and I think uh, I think we did a Mega Dr- yeah, we did a Mega Drive version of Syndicate as well. And you kind of have to just rethink things um, a bit, but without trying to you know go too far away from what's so cool about the game. Yeah, they're all, all challenges, but yeah, as Gary said, really smart bunch of people. All, as as the team grew, it grew really slowly. But um, yeah, everyone there was, um, except for me and Gary, were really smart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought <laughs> I thought the Snares version of Syndicate was a uh, uh, pretty unique as well, it, and it had a very kind of theme parky look about it. 
I mean, just I mean, just it's it's pretty much just starting again. You kind of there's there's no code you can use, and I guess some of the graphics um, you're right. You'd have yeah. to be reworked because it's completely completely wrong. So yeah, it's just a a lot of stuff that um, needs to be worked through, and it take, take quite a long time. But I guess the games didn't take as long to make originally then as as they seem to do now. But um, you're right. For for an artist, it was a great living because I must have worked on so many other games that I had nothing to do with just to say, oh, yeah, I'll port the, you know, Master System version of your game because you, you, you really couldn't take anything over. Pretty much everything had to be completely reconfigured. I mean, obviously, they dump all the texture sheets, sprite sheets out, but you had to, you know, completely rework everything. So it was quite a good living out of just being a conversion artist mm. back then. So I used to kind of do that in the evening sometimes. You know, I, I worked on Bitmap Brothers games and, you know, I did Xenon 2 on the Master System and, and I didn't do anything original. I just kind of refactored. You're kind of like, a, I suppose, a renovator. In to, if I'm trying to think of something to compare it to, someone who's painting over something, someone else's work and trying to do yeah. it justice if it's all, you know. So... There was a lot of that going on. Well, I guess um, uh, in some cases... code's the same, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you think we were putting um, games onto the Mac as well, and that, that, was, that wasn't even grayscale, it was black and white, and there was just two colours. So I don't know if you were working on any of that, that graphics. Yeah, but, um, I, did some, uh, I did some of the PC, whether it be the, the different graphics card versions of the PC version and the Mac versions... Yeah, your department when you started it was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I don't have to you don't do have that to do anymore. <laughs> again. Yeah. Well, let's talk about theme parks. Obviously, that was a massive hit. And, you know, again, on so many different platforms. What did you think of the idea of theme park, Gary, when you first heard about it? Uh, we all know what know. Gary thought. <laughs> no, no, I hated it. <laughs> I just thought, I just thought how cool we'd been making all these great killing sort of games. games. Yeah. Like, you know, like prop, I thought popular the original populace and it was not nothing to do with with me or mark we weren't there but i just thought it was a revolutionary game it was like a you know a proper attempt to put i don't know it it, it felt grown up to me it felt like a real you know genius idea and then power monger in itself you know was was quite a brave attempt at a sort of a strategy game some of it was kind of randomly generated but there's still a lot of really cool things and you really felt like you were kind of campaigning and, and moving across a vast you know endless world and all that sounded like oh i want to make these games and then when peter came up he'd gone to japan with the success of everything we'd done and he just saw lots of vivid color games lots of games with colorful backgrounds and you know sprites with you know the head was the same size as the body kind of style which you know we all recognize today it's, it's kind of still there and he just wanted to kind of, and also theme parks were massive. You know, he went to a few and, and, and they, they were just popping up everywhere. So he, he could just see this kind of opportunity. And I just hated it. I hated it. It was awful. And um, I think I worked for it on my own as well because Peter was still finishing something. I think it, I still think it was Powermonger on PC because it was a bit of a pain to get on there. And um, I was on my own for about four, five, six months. We all went to theme parks, which was fun. We all went on these kind of trips. <laughs> the research to, trips. Yeah. <laughs> research trips. In fact, I went to Euro Disney uh, when it wasn't open. We got to go on all the rides when it was basically still in development. That bit was good. I didn't mind doing all that stuff. No, but, but you didn't. Yeah. But the, but, but the game was just... It's just the oh, artists uh, that, that went. Peter and, the, and, and you artists who yeah. went to... to yeah, and the, and it's kind of like... Me and Paul oh, McLaughlin, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you, you, you need inspiration to make you know, oh, oh, boo -hoo, <laughs> but yeah. I didn't fall out uh, with anybody I just thought I, I can't work on this game it's too childish I thought it was a really childish game I left and as I said earlier I'd done some sort of freelance work with the Bitmap Brothers and I knew them anyway from the 80s we used to drink together and you know we were making we were very similar studios with sort of same kind of sensibilities and uh, I just thought yeah I'm just going to go to the cool company and then, uh, and then that that year and a half I left, they released Theme Park. My work's still in it, 
but uh, uh, so we Finn deleted it, Gary. It. No, <laughs> I thought you had done until I actually saw it. <laughs> um, you released Theme Park, you released Syndicate, and you released Magic Carpet, and it was all in that eighteen months I was away. So I was wondering, were there any like theme ideas that uh, didn't go ahead, or were any people making like crazy suggestions? Well, we, Gary and I, after I mean, after we'd done Theme. Um, Theme Hospital, we, we had a whole bunch of ideas that we thought, oh, this would um, we'll do theme prison, theme resort. And we kind of imagined going on and uh, it was, if the game had a, something on it, it said designer series. I don't know where that came from, the marketing people. But we kind of thought, well, we'll carry on with the designer series because it's, uh, yeah, it's really good fun. And um, that was our, our passion for doing these kind of games, which eventually brought us all back to... Uh, back together at um, two point. But yeah, I, I don't know, Gary, whether there were any. Well, I, I think the bit we've missed out is I came back, obviously, and Mark, you were running that team and it, it wasn't a great team. Let's be honest. It, it, it was a very small team. Do you team mean the, um, what team are you talking about? The hospital team? Hospital team. That was yeah. just me. Thanks very much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark, so uh, uh, when I came back with my tail between my legs, I knew Mark, obviously. I re- we really got on, and uh, Peter put with put us together. Um, but I, it was clear to me and Mark, I think, maybe more me than you, Mark, because I think you were always a bit more positive than I was. But I kind of thought, this is the Z team. This is me being put in the crappy team because I went away. But, you know, And there were, there were a lot of really smart people still there and some new people but none of them were on this project it was mark just plugging away making this game and the i didn't know you was, felt that way gary about me yeah I, I, so well, I, I loved you i just didn't think i just thought theme hospital it doesn't even make sense <laughs> theme park makes sense theme hospital yeah. doesn't make sense everything about it just felt like an absolute turkey i thought it was the worst idea to, well to, to uh, worst idea according to you since theme park of course and uh because <laughs> you and, and you couldn't really leave again could you it'd been too embarrassing no i would be ridiculous yeah. so i was kind of stuck with it but um yeah i i guess you know mark and i did a lot of research and it was going to be a serious originally a serious hospital simulation game i remember doing my original graphics for it i tried to do as realistic as possible and we were going to do real illnesses and real so we had to go and research lots of things at at hospitals and work out how the business of running a general hospital worked we asked we, we spent time with you know hospital managers we spent weeks researching how we were going to gamify it and uh it it was just ridiculous yeah and it looked I mean, the hospitals kind of look pretty dull, don't they? And, I mean, yeah. I guess our game looked like that as well. But, I mean, it did, it did really. But <laughs> it's just kind of walking around and going, oh, my God, it's just corridors, isn't it? It's um, And then hoping to see some cool machine that goes bing. But there wasn't any. And um, there was a few, of course. But, I mean, I guess the, the big scanners were the most exciting-looking things. But generally, In fact, in hospital work, the scan machine, the cardiography machine from Theme Hospital, this is, guys. Mm. That's what the whole game... I don't know if you remember, they look kind of realistic. Yeah, they're, they're like a, a very different kind of style yeah, to the actual that was, uh, drawing. They, were, they yeah. were assets made when the game all looked like that. And yeah. it was only when we decided to change it into this kind of made-up illnesses, made-up cure thing, that we veered away from... We went all Heath Robinson and Willy Wonka. Well, I guess and, the and diagnosis just... stuff was is is kind of real world ish with like a running machine. Kind of, but yeah. I, but a lot of it. Even when we started to bring in that change of direction, we then didn't really go back to it. So we built the desks, we built the wards, we got the scanning machine, and we got the cardiography machine, and I think we built a radiator as well. In fact, the radiator was done by a work experience guy called George Zamowski. Uh, and, and they're quite like boring elements, but they were yeah. really good actually and really important to like, you know, make people comfortable in, yeah. in the rooms. And then, uh, you know, the whole drinks machine aesthetic and all the kind of ideas of, uh, you know, keeping the place clean and stuff that all 
fell into theme park. No, as you're well. right. Really I, I, I tell you, I, I, I tell you what else is, and we say this to our artists now is when sometimes when we people assume we have got to be all wacky and crazy and zany and all those crappy words, right? You have to ground all humour in reality, and it has to be re- realistic to a degree. And then when you put those twists in, it kind of accentuates it. And sometimes, even Two Point, we're guilty when we make our games of going, there's not enough of this based in reality. We need to put some more real things into it. Not If everything is, you know, zany, it's real yeah. and zany, it, it isn't funny. You've got to know where to put the gags, right, in the game. And, and Hospital was great at that, partly by accident because we built a, a more played straight game initially. But you're right, we did a lot of things like housekeeping of the game yeah was you know bins uh radiators the, the kind of meat of the game was the meat was of the game there, the, yeah. the minute to minute stuff was quite straight wasn't it and then punctuated with bloaty head slack tongue hairy itis jelly itis whatever i um, i i also think the whole idea of the game wh- when you're playing it you know you relax you've set up your place and then suddenly chaos happens there's an outbreak there's a helicopter landing with loads of people you know um, wave <laughs> yeah yeah and uh just kind of the breaking up of that normality was really important yeah it was it was i mean mark mark and i had a really i think a really good i knew when i worked with mark immediately knew we were right for each other to work because i think we just had the right kind of personality for each other there's a lot of listening to each other's ideas and it, back then there weren't designers it wasn't a title you had i mean mark was more on the uh, Programmer. production programming yeah. side you know and i was on the the art side the animation side but i think the ideas thing was just something i mean to be fair to mark he collated it without a doubt you know there was no way i could say i collated the game mark did you know mark would hold a meeting on a monday down the pub and i think you you were almost like the editor really yeah kind of well it's such a small team it's kind of it yeah. yeah, it's easier yeah. but to that just, was your kind of production yeah. sensibilities i think you were really good at kind of you know pulling the best bits together at that point well but, um I, I remember um us all coming in i mean i say all oh, there was like four of us we came in one weekend <laughs> because we were trying to get to alpha and there's this kind of this milestone where kind of everything's done and we kind of came in and we were working and we kind of because there wasn't any real proper processes we we kind of go i think we're alpha aren't we and we, we go um yeah, I think we are, and uh, it's was, it was kind of weird, wasn't it? It's just um, you had a notebook. Yeah, yeah. You were really good at taking notes. Do you remember? I mean, you still are, right? You do take a lot of notes. In fact, your note taking is quite. You're quite proud. I've of written notes taking, here you know? as we're talking. As um, well. But that was it. I mean, basically, it was what's everyone doing? What were you doing last week? What what you got to do next week? You know what? You know what did we agree in the last? Week? You know, Mark had it all in front of him, and there was a point when you had nothing. You turned the page, and I think we're black, done. Yeah, it? and you went, I think we're done. <laughs> it felt weird. So then, all it was—it was all about the balance and the bug fixing and, bug and fixing. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one thing I'm interested in yeah. as well. Because obviously, it was a big game, and you know, set in the hospital. There's huge levels as well. Was it a bit of a balancing act trying to make the game fun without being like really resource heavy? Um, when you say resource heavy, in terms of uh, what using the like, PC, like the kind of yeah, like the spec you needed on. Yeah. Well, you know, it. we we were at a point where everyone else was starting to use 3d so we basically had just a our engine the heart of our engine was just a sprite draw so and that had been around and developed by peter and glenn f- for ages um so that that's kind of stuff was pretty efficient so we didn't really actually run into any problems of of it being no. being it was, uh, slow and in fact we, we were taking um what theme park hadn't done is put a limiter in it and we i I'm so glad we did because uh, put a limiter in because a couple of years later is the games are running ten times the speed they should be. So um, so no, it, we didn't really have too much of a problem. I guess the levels weren't that big; they were pretty efficient sprite draws. That, that sprite yeah. draw, though, Mark was it was written by primarily Peter. I think you're right. Glenn had owned it and had coded it, in it and I think you had as well, but. It was everything it did was under direction of either me 
primarily me to be honest because no, not many other people used it i imagine finn at some point might have said oh i need a function that does this because it was effectively the setup for the things you saw on the screen so what the artist needed to set up was in the sprite drawer so all the keys were just whatever the artist wanted the key to be <laughs> so none of it was using any protocols that you use today in any kind of art tool it was completely non-transferable skills it was a, it was a a bespoke engine that drove the moving parts of the game and it was asked for primarily by the artist where you know i need a function that does this i want to change overlay sprites i want to be able to do a sequence it's a sequencer basically wasn't uh, yeah it? i guess that that's the bit that we did develop quite a lot of the um, yeah you did yeah where we were trying to get you know two sprites uh, i i talk about this quite a lot throughout my life and, and nobody kind of uh, ever <laughs> realizes how good it is, but it's, it's I mean, it's, it's rubbish compared to what everyone else does. But ha- no, having, no, we, we, we had like a, a sprite of a desk and a sprite of a doctor. And of course, if you kind of put your, the sprite in front of it, you, you're trying to get the, the doctor to sit down at the desk. And of course he, he walks in front of the desk and he goes behind it and then pulls a chair out, sits down and doing that with sprites, there are two separate sprites is quite, um, quite tricky so the thing that we'd kind of developed was this uh thing called the the complex engine which was basically we'd take two sprites and then when they got to the when the character that's interacting with the say the desk got to the right point it would swap it out obviously just within a frame to a you know a combination of of the sprite and the doctor so gary had to set all that stuff up but it worked really nicely i think and um you know, I don't think anyone has ever looked at it and gone, oh, that's clever. But, uh, but it is, it though, is. Mark, because it's really think, think about it this way, right? We're making games, you know, in essence, inspired by games we made 25 years ago. And we still can't make people in, the, in our games today go to a door, drop the handle of the door, pull it open, walk through it and close it behind them right? We were doing that 25 years ago because of your engine. Mm -hmm. It allowed you to, the artist, to completely accurately, pixel perfectly accurately, line these things up. So weirdly, uh, it was quite a technical job for me back then because I had to use Mark's system, the sequencer, and I had to sort of set up these things to work. So if somebody ever sat at a chair, I had to set it up how they got it to the entry and exit point open a filing cabinet, go through a door, get into a machine, you know, whether they're going to auto autopsy, how they got in, how they got out, what they were looking like. Gary, they stuff. never got out of auto autopsy. <laughs> no, no, all, that, all that kind <laughs> of uh, pathfinding <laughs> but, and stuff. But all, yeah. that, all that stuff, Mark just said to me, I don't care what it does, but you, I need to know where my I'm going to code it, the person, to get to the, the entry point and where the exit point is. And everything during the activity... It's up to you, gave yeah. me the ability to do with it what I did. So from game point of view, it was about the most pure programmer artist game together because it was quite technical to set these things up because obviously I had to do male, female, all ethnicities, different clothing mm. types, different props. Someone might have glasses on. Someone might have a cane or a hat. So all of these had to do that in the sequencer. So every single variant which Mark used to randomly generate I had to make sure that every variant worked and only I could verify that because I kind of owned that part of it. So it, it was a hundred percent Mark and I were back to back. We sat back to back and that was the guts of the game really. Cause it was just the sequencer driving the navig- the navigation into the events out of it, that and the simulation changing. So I, uh, you know, if it broke, I, I was like as much, of a normally artists don't break the game because huh. they're not as in the guts. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is, I think I probably had more bugs than anybody because I had to sort of set it set it up. But I really enjoyed it. It was a hundred percent effort from us because we felt we were the underdogs at the, at the studio at the time. There was you've got to remember it was Dungeon Keeper. It was Populous Three at that point. It was. Magic Carpet mm. 2, uh, Syndicate Wars. There were other games which never came out, which were looking amazing, like Creation and another game called the... Well, um, Gene Wars came Swift. out, didn't it, as well? Gene yeah. Wars came out as well. But we just weren't very flashy looking. We were sprite-based. And 
yeah, we just didn't expect to get, you know, any kind of press interest in our game. So we just worked really hard to make it a good game. I'm quite interested in that, you know, the, the last era of kind of Bullfrog and kind of transitioning into Lionhead, because obviously you went with Peter Molyneux and you worked on Black and White. So what was it kind of like, that transition between the two companies and what memories have you got at that time? Well, that was me, because Gary went and uh, co-founded, helped the guys run um, Mucky Foot. Mm. Uh, and for me... That, that good, he can't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember. I just check in my notes and so make sure I was right. Um, yeah, so that well, Peter was still finishing Dungeon Keeper as uh, we'd finished Theme Hospital, and my daughter was born in the March, and I think the game came out in the March. So I kind of didn't really go back to the office that much, and then to, you know, we we knew we were setting up uh, Lionhead, and I, when I left. Um, it was just really myself and um, Tim Rance were kind of doing a bit of programming, right, in some sort of... Were you called Red Eye then? We did, yeah, Red Eye. We didn't really have a proper name. We hadn't sort of settled on anything. Um, and so we, we were kind of waiting for Peter to finish Dungeon Keeper. And so we were also having a, a bunch of meetings with EA about the publishing deal, which would help Peter leave... Um, EA slash uh, Bullfrog, uh, and for us to set up Lionhead. So that was going on in the in the background. Peter was finishing off Dungeon Keeper, and they'd been moved out of – because Peter they knew Peter was leaving, they asked him to go and work out of the office, to, to leave the office. So he went down to his house and took his team down there, and they finished it. And and then just transitioning into, into Lionhead was, you know, it was – Really exciting. Again, it was a really small team to start with, just probably four or five of us, and it was slowly growing. And in fact, we, we did talk to you, Gary, about you you coming to join us as well. But um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, and oh, you did. I remember you did. I do remember that chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, well, you chose the wrong wrong route. And <laughs> but, uh, well, <laughs> Another title uh, worth mentioning definitely was Fable as well. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, what do you think made Fable so popular? Hmm. It's a pretty good game. I, think, I, I, I always think it was because back then RPGs were primarily PC and quite, they were quite, I don't know, hardcore. And I, I think putting it on a console was quite unique and making it accessible and not necessarily trying to be you know for a particular type yeah try not I to be too did... nerdy as well i guess and uh, yeah, and, yeah, and being yeah. quite <laughs> quite funny as well i think there's there's a lot of humor in um in fable as well but um it was a lovely game to play so i think it was a difficult game it was never easy to make a fable game i don't think any of them were a easy like, I think Hospital, for example, was a very smooth game to, to have worked on. A lot of my team worked on the Fable games when they got into that difficult period of yeah. making finding the fun. And I don't think any of them went really smoothly. Even Fable 1 took a while because it had been, you know, it had different names. It was called a, a Project Ego and all sorts of things. Wish World, and, yeah. In Wish yeah. World. And it had been developed initially out of house by big blue box under the if you like guidance of lionhead and then it had to be brought in house to try and finish it and um they've all been difficult births haven't they mark they Not, have. it wasn't one smooth fable yeah they're all quite difficult games to make i mean i kind of we were kind of working i mean i think for some of the some, some of the fable games i think some of the team definitely felt burnt out and there was a lot of there was always a lot more work to do than than really we were able to do well, well let's give them credit we were a first party studio uh, by the time of fable 2 yeah and we were having to compete along with the halo team which was now had been bungie obviously but then it had become the in-house is it 343 can't remember exactly the name i think it's that Turn 10 doing the Forza games, Epic doing Gears of War. These studios were like 500 to 1,000 people each. 
and Linehead was still a couple of hundred people, and less than that working on Fable, probably 120 people on Fable. So we, we were doing, you know, AAA games with a fraction of the headcount. So we were obviously going to hit turbulent water from time to time, trying to sort of hit release dates. And the release dates are really important for, for Microsoft, as they would be. You know, they put a lot of money behind marketing and things like that. So I think it was always a bit of a shame that certain features didn't make the cut and that and certain things promised didn't get done. But that was just people don't realize how difficult it is when your team is a fraction of the size of a you know, some of the biggest studios around mm. the world. We were never that big, Lionhead. Never big. I think the biggest head count was about three hundred and fifty. Yeah, that was over three three games there, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it's the fact that, I mean, obviously everyone's hyped for the new Fable game that's coming out next year. And it kind of feels like, you know, the fact that we, we mentioned before that it's the 20th anniversary of Fable this year, or in terms of its release, I know you, you were saying before the call, Mark, that it was, um, you know, it was worked on for a long time before that. I was just quite curious as to, you know, that longevity there as well. I mean, why do you think people are still so hyped about it all these years on? Mm, interesting. I guess every year we've been waiting for for the for the new fable, and um, yeah, I guess a, a lot of people remember it fondly. So, and I don't know how wide that circle is of of people that are really looking forward to um, seeing Fable come out. Mm. Whether it's whether it's sort of a, a mass market or as uh, or it's kind of just us old hacks that remember it first time round. Uh, I think it was ahead of its time in a lot of ways, Mark. It, it addressed sexuality, it addressed relationships. Mm. It didn't make you. F- it wasn't overly macho. Mm. It wasn't. I think it had it, moral choices too. I think, I think, I think and lot, consequences. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Of course, yeah. classically moral yeah. choices. But I think a lot. You know, we've seen a huge growth in players now in the last fifteen, twenty years, where it's no longer. As I said earlier, when I started, it was the domain of the smelly boy who played games in. You know bedroom and, and i think now it's games are for everybody smelly um, girls as well smelly girls smelly <laughs> boys and just anybody any just anybody and it doesn't discriminate now and i think fable was really really good at saying everybody will like something about this game uh, you know no matter what kind of gamer you are no matter what whether you're a boy girl or anything else you know it's a game for everybody so i think it did that not consciously by the way i think it just did that i think as well it also had that kind of obviously with it being you know from you guys had that kind of british charm and humor about it as well which i'm, I'm wondering whether they're going to retain that in like the new game or whether that'll be missing yeah that's that that's interesting well i mean a lot of that came from i mean uh, dean and simon carter were were the, the two brothers that started big blue box um Dean said, and they're like characters. Yeah. Yeah, they are <laughs> really, yeah. So a lot of that humour. I mean, and, and Mike McCarthy looks like something out. Yeah. He was kind of an artist mm. who was, he did a lot of the concept work for it. He looked like he was out of Fable too. I think, it, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do with it. Whether I kind of seen the trailers, and uh, yeah, I don't really, I can't really tell whether they're going for the humour or they're going, okay, this is just a reboot, and we're going to do something a bit different but i think you know anyone that remembers fable like we do we're looking forward to it and mm. hoping they it's a great game It'd be great to see it out i mean again. i'd rather it survive than yeah. doesn't yeah. and if it has to be another studio I, I don't agree with the way the studio was closed and i don't think it was the smartest idea to let all that experience you know slip between your fingers it needed to change, uh, for sure. But it needed to it change needed away to from a, a like a free to play um, yeah, yeah. game, but, which but which that wasn't is... the decision made by the team. No. It's a decision made at a higher level. So yeah. I think it's taken them a lot longer to get to probably where the game was already. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone that was involved in any of the original stuff has has been involved in the. In the... I think a few people have done some things, Mark. Have they? I'm not sure. I couldn't name. Yeah, I think oh. that, n- none of the, if you like the, maybe the designers, the, you know, the most well known people, yeah. but there are people who've gone over and worked on it who've worked on the uh, previous. Oh, games. really? I didn't I realize. I, I, not many, and um, uh, none of the leadership team, if you like, of that project. But it's just a shame that it had to be completely shut down and everything, you know, 
be lost to then reboot something that perhaps isn't a million miles away from where we were mm-hmm. anyway. So we'll see how it goes. I mean, I've got, you know, Playground, a fantastic studio. The, you know, they're one of the best British studios out there. So I can't think of a better studio to take up. Take up. Yeah. You know, so take it well, <laughs> well, talking of uh, fantastic but, British studios as well, uh, you guys have your own studio, Two Point Studios, which, you know, mm. I've heard so much about. I've, I've played all your games. I absolutely love it. But I was interested in how you started it and also how Sega got involved and kind of what your vision for the company was. <laughs> I needed a job. Um, <laughs> It's one of the reasons. Um, no, I wanted to work with Mark again. Mark and I kind of left Lionhead before the it had finished. Mark, I think, uh, two years before me. But it, the writing was on the wall, and um, Peter had gone at this point, obviously. Mark didn't probably want to be part of that. Yeah, I'd, I'd had enough of computer games. Yeah. I thought they were stupid, <laughs> and I didn't want to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to put it nicer than that, yeah. but Mark was a bit um, uh, disillusioned at that point. And I'd done some incubation work. I took over from a lot of stuff Mark had in- initially set up within Lionhead, which was a lot of the creative day was something Mark owned. And I took over that when you left Mark. And we ran these uh, wonderful incentives to let the studio, which was about, let's say, 200, 250 people, create ideas and a lot of that stuff was amazing and a lot of good stuff came out of it a lot of stuff should have come out of it but i i then went on to do an incubation team i didn't work on the the last fable and fable i really wanted to get something new off the ground and was frustrated how difficult that was and i think that team also was under pressure to support fable and it just felt like here we go again so I left and um, I, I, I contacted Mark and said, I think we can probably work together again. Um, and I think we could do things that Linehead of used to do really well. So we've missed out a big thing here. Mark and I worked on, along with Ben Huskins and a few other key people that, uh, like you know, Mark Smart and Chris Norton, a lot of people that work with us today on a game called The Movies, which was probably the last little people game, game. Yeah. <laughs> that line head, a.k.a. Bullfrog, uh, made. So um, we worked on that game. We loved that game. And um, when when Microsoft bought Linehead, they really bought the Fable brand and everything else wasn't really core to their business. So we, Mark and I were a bit fish out of water, I guess, from there on in, and we didn't really get to make the games we were good at making. So we got together and with a bit of convincing from me, if I'm honest, because I think Mark was quite probably less desperate than I was to keep working. We got in our cars, drove around the country, met a bunch of people and started talking about doing a new studio based out of our history of making these games. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, you, you'd met Ben Hymers as well at Lionhead and he's, he's an old Theme Hospital uh, fanboy. Uh, and he was he was a good programmer, a brilliant programmer. So he he was kind of part of the mix once we'd kind of been able to get like a publishing deal together. Yeah, I, I knew I couldn't do it without Mark, and I knew we shouldn't do it without Ben. So I kind of kidded Mark on a little bit that Ben was on board, and I knew Ben wouldn't be on board if we didn't get a deal. I think Mark found that out quite quickly, and. I just needed to convince Mark that Ben was a really good, if you like, technical person because we needed someone technical to sort of prove out our prototypes and that kind of thing. So, well, we were thinking, yeah, we were thinking of doing a Kickstarter as well, weren't we? We kind of, yeah, our route to to get it off the ground was maybe a Kickstarter and yeah. Uh, I didn't even know what that was, really. I'd seen, I basically, uh, through the incubation work, we were looking at a lot of indie games to see why little games were doing quite well. So we were looking at things like Prison Architect, you know, at the time. And it wasn't that long before things like Minecraft had just blown up. And there were a lot of real indie darling companies coming up and doing stuff with relatively small teams. And and I guess what I was trying to do with the incubation team was see if we could spin something up, you know, within the Lionhead studio. So 
And then you realise a lot of these things were kind of crowdfunded. So I, I remember Ben and I were talking, and Ben was much more telling me that this was the way to go than me being the evangelist of it. And Mark was probably outside of that world for a bit too long to even know well, it was going on. So I hadn't we, even we, heard we, of the <laughs> internet at this point. Well, I, I, I was kind of wondering, though, like, Theme Hospital, it's, it's one of those games that I could sit there and play any time. But, um, you know, modernising yeah. it and uh, uh, making a, a new kind of title must have seemed like an obvious thing to you guys. But was it hard to, you know, convince other people that this would be really successful outside of that kind of world? Mm. Uh, no, to be honest, we we, we did speak to um, a few people and I think, you know, the, the feedback was really positive. Maybe that's what you get all the time, but they go, but the, they didn't actually have any money. Cause we'd actually want a lot of money kind of, in fact, we kind of really underestimated we're, we're what we're asking. Not. We are still <laughs> very cheap as well. Um, but um, yeah, we, we weren't asking for a lot, but we kind of, we we're almost at the point of going, right, we've, we've given it a go. We we're going to give up. And, um, and we were introduced via Ben who'd gone to work. Um, where was he working, Gary? He's working at a uh, sports company uh, that did... Motorsport uh, Manager, yeah. Motorsport Manager team. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so. so they were signed to Sega at the time, and uh, Christian um, basically introduced us, the uh, head of the team sort of, um, introduced us, and they said, yeah, we're really interested. We were just talking the other day about wouldn't it be cool to have a... A, a team doing stuff like Bullfrog used to, and there was us pretending we had a team, and we started talking to them for probably, I guess it was eight, eight, nine months. They were, they were just acquiring Amplitude at the time, so kept going quiet for a while. But we were lucky, and we thought there's when we were introduced to Sega, we thought oh, there's no way they're, they're too big; they're not going to be interested in us. But they were, and I have to say, I've loved working with Sega. They've been. They've been amazing. I mean, a lot of changes over the time that we've been there. But well, as a publisher goes, you know, probably the best uh, ones we've ever worked with, Gary, would you say? Easily. Mm, easily. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've kind of never tried to – a lot of publishers – and they don't intend to do this. It's not me trying to be sort of harsh on all the publishers. But when, when they publish you, they – they try and change you, you know, not consciously, but subconsciously. They want you to sort of do things a different way. And then you kind of wonder why they wanted to sign you in the first place. And, and Sega have never done that. They've kind of let us be us. And that's what's brilliant about them. And, uh, you know, they, they don't try to sort of say, oh, we, we know mm. better because we're paying I, I, the bills, right? They go, we're paying the bills, so hopefully we've made the right decision in trusting you guys. I that's think as well it could have been just aimed as a – you know, nostalgic kind of look back at the past yeah. and uh, not engaged any any new users and uh, people that, you know, didn't know of the series and are now kind of in the two-point world and, um, you know, kind of have really embraced it. How, how, how did you engage those new users? We're kind of still not sure whether, how, many, um, how many people remember the nostalgia of theme uh, well, as soon as I saw it, I was like, joke. oh, my God. <laughs> but, but I'm right. a, probably a rarity. Yeah, I, I, I think it, no, I, I think I think you're right. I think I think definitely Theme Hospital scratched the itch. What we've had to do, which is really difficult, is we've done that. You can't play that trick again. You can't say, hey, look, do you want another one of those? So all our games going forward and the ones we've got planned into the, you know, the next decade is our, our changing and evolving ideas. It's not, we don't want to do the same thing. You know, Bullfrog never did the same thing. Now we obviously, it's difficult to get approval to make something completely different, but we want to evolve what we're doing. The first game was obviously tapping into our, our heritage and that's, that's fine because everyone's got, an, everyone needs to have something they can a card they can play because there's a lot of games that come out a year and if you don't do that then you're just not going to get any visibility so we that was obvious but i think everything we're doing now step changes into something more you know more and more from <laughs> basically not from a uh from the history books from from our kind of great team that we've put together and we're pulling these great new you know, games that are in the same, yes, it's in the same genre. Yes, they're little people games, but they're kind of looking yeah. forward rather than back. And I think that's what we have to do. So, uh, yes, 
I, I, I still think two point hospital is its own game. It, it's not, it's not a carbon copy. No, of no. theme hospital by any stretch of the imagination, but it taps in to the nostalgia for sure. And, and why not? Well, I think, I, think we, it's that, I think we invented that between us, didn't we, Mark? Well, we, I mean, did. we, we came up with that game. Why can't we can't, you know, it's it's in our DNA to make something with that humor, with that charm. Uh, and I think that also do, goes so. on to two point campus as well, because um one mod I used to love was the Sims University. Uh, and that that was one, oh, yeah. you know, having oh, having yeah. traits in there, but also having more of a kind of focus on the relationships in a two point campus that is a lot more yeah. different and, than and the same theme with your you characters know. longer. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it, every time we kind of start a new game, we, we're, we're always kind of trying to level up. I mean, and certainly getting closer to your, your, your characters with the students and, and having relationships as we kind of just, we're just trying to do different things. Um, you know, it's 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 a journey, and we've only taken two baby steps, and uh, I think we're going to be talking about another step um, next month um, that, that we're doing. But we're always kind of thinking, you know, what hasn't gone well? What what? Why aren't people more people playing it? Or you know, what yeah, don't we people always like? look at the negatives? Don't yeah, we? we do, and I think yeah. getting trying to get go for high quality that's really important to us to kind of we play the game so so much and you were just playing it and playing it thousands of hours you know and that's kind of nice that, that we've got a two point you know gary and i you know we're sort of studio heads but you know, we spend most of our time playing the games and not getting bogged down in 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 lots of and, different and you, uh, you've still directions. got those kind of meat elements yeah. as well in there like you know putting the bins in the right places and all the kind of stuff yes. that yeah. yeah i mean in fact i was learning about that today i was i was actually literally saying you're missing uh, them I don't, <laughs> yeah i'm just sort of saying i don't want some of those real housekeeping things to get diminished sometimes you kind of want to Evolve an idea up and, and relegate some things or, or, or push things. You out. didn't want but, toilets in the current game. No, I didn't. I actually don't. I hate toilets in our games. I, oh yeah, I do yeah. Hate I, that. <laughs> but that's another argument. I could talk about the cubicles but... in the hospital for for hours. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, to be to be honest, I just don't like. I, well, anyway, I, I do agree with you absolutely, Ravi. There, there needs to be a very housekeepy thing to do because I love weird things in in sim games i i need to queue manage i need to you know occasionally direct my staff to do things even though they're going to do it right i need to sort of be hands-on and play with it and tweak it to as much as i want to and um and sometimes they're really menial things like just tidying a room up in the game so i i, I do worry sometimes if we always put a bigger idea in that we have to re- reject some of these simple pleasures of <laughs> making sure you know yeah. There's enough bins or enough fire extinguishers uh, so things don't catch fire. Um, One day, Gary, we won't need bins in our game. <laughs> you know it. Well, guys, it's been absolutely incredible reminiscing with you. and Amazing to hear the passion still burns strong as well. We can't wait, wait to see what, what is next from you guys when you can talk about it. So, uh, yeah, please do keep in touch with us. And obviously, we'll be keeping an eye out as well. We so uh, thanks so much for coming on and uh, reminiscing with us. It's been wonderful to chat to you both. All right. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.